What is up guys, Mike Willoughby here, The Steel Corner. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about match conduct and flow within your squad. So we're talking primarily about level 1 matches, just little club matches that you'll shoot on the weekends. This isn't about major matches because that's a different philosophy, different list of things to do, different packing lists. We can go into that some other time. But today we're talking about level 1 matches at your local club. So what I like to do, I like to get there right at or right before the time that registration starts. So the first time that's listed on practice score usually is the time that I like to get there. So say registration starts at 9, safety brief at 9.45, hammer down at 10. I'm trying to get there between 8.50 and 9 o'clock. And there's a few reasons for that, and I think that really sets you up for success the best. Obviously, it can't happen every time. We all run late from time to time, but that's what I like to do. So what I like to do when I first get to a match, unpack my stuff, set up my cart, pull it all out of the car. Then I prefer to load mags there. As soon as I pull everything out while I'm standing there at the car, go to the bathroom if I need to. Obviously, do that before if you need to. From there, get checked in. So that normally takes me 5-10 minutes to get everything set up. In the summer, it'll take a little bit longer because I'm hauling around a giant umbrella getting that set up because I'm a pale ginger and I hate the sun. So go get checked in. And then once you get checked in, I like to holster up, throw my holster on, go to a safe table, throw my gun in the holster, get a couple of draws in at the safe table, but I don't go crazy. Not normally there for more than a minute or two. Not gonna be at the safe table all morning doing dry fire. Get what you need to, get comfortable on the gun, adjust your dot. I leave my dots on all day. Unless it's a Seymour, those things kill batteries. But all my other dots, my SROs, my Romeo 3s, I just leave them on for the entire match. So at the safe table, holster up, turn the dot on, call it good. From there, I'm going to go walk the bays. I'm going to go look at what stages are in which bays, and then I'm going to figure out which squad I'm on and where I'm starting. And from there, the rest of it's just saying hey to the homies, you know, going to all these local matches. Normally know most of the people there. And if not, it's always good to meet new people there, especially before the shooting starts and you don't have your hearing protection in and you can actually have a conversation and understand what each other is saying. If you ever talk to me on a range and I'm feeling like I'm being short with you, it's because I'm deaf and I can't understand a word. It has nothing to do with you. I'm not trying to be an asshole. It's just having hearing protection in. I'm already hard of hearing as it is. So add in hearing protection on top of that. I usually can't understand what people are saying. If I ever uh, seem short with you on the range, it's because I have no idea. All right, so you've scoped out the bays, you've loaded your mags, you've got your cart with you, you know which bay you're going to, go to your bay, say hello to the squad, get your eyes and ears on, obviously, figure out the shooting order. If nobody is taking charge of your squad, if nobody's being the RO, if nobody's running the tablet, pick them up, just run it. Nobody cares if you're a certified RO at a level 1 local match. You know the commands, just run the commands. If you mess it up, just run them again. It happens. Don't let your squad flounder because nobody wants to step up and run the tablet. Nobody wants to step up and run the timer. So, when you are running the tablet, let people know the shooting order. At least the person on deck and in the hole. But I like to call out the entire shooting order every time that I'm on a bay. The way I usually like squads to flow at this point, this is not how I always felt, but this is how my opinion has evolved over time. I prefer people that are shooting two guns do not shoot back to back. So if you're shooting a rimfire gun and a centerfire gun, you don't shoot back to back. So normally on my squads, everybody is shooting two guns. So it'll go A through Z and then A through Z again. Paint. Some people really like their targets painted and that's perfectly fine. In all reality, I think everybody should be painting the targets every time. And if your squad works well, it is not any slower than not painting the targets. Let me tell you what I mean by that. First shooters in the box, they're on their fifth string. Two people should already have paint cans in their hand. As soon as the range is clear, as soon as that command is given from the ROs, those two people with paint cans in their hand go down and paint the targets and come back. By that time, the person that is up to shoot should have their magazine staged on the barrel, they should be standing in the box and just waiting for the make ready command. If a squad flows like that, if people are painting on time as soon as the range is clear, and then the next shooter is staging their equipment while they're painting, obviously you don't touch your gun until the make ready, but if you stage your magazines, that's perfectly within the rules. You are allowed to step into the box, 
You are allowed to take your magazines out of your pouches, assuming you don't store them with your gun, and then stage them on the barrel or whatever table you have there. And then as soon as the make ready command is given, because the painters are back and the range is clear, RO says make ready. That time, if you're efficient about painting like that, it's really maybe 15, 20 seconds slower than not painting and the person just walking up, dumping all their gear on the barrel and then getting ready. In my experience, if you have a squad that is prepared like that, it will flow just as fast as shooting back to back and not painting in between. So when I first started shooting, I used to like to shoot back to back because I thought it was faster. I used to like to not paint at all because I thought it was faster. But the reality is, if you're on a good squad, you can shoot not back to back and you can have your targets painted and it takes about the exact same time. So in the rant, we talked about Bluetooth timers. When you're running the tablet, it makes a huge difference. If you are not using Bluetooth timers, you need to pay attention and make sure that you're not scoring errors. I know that I've seen it on numerous occasions when you get home from a match and you see someone with an outlandish time that is nowhere near their other times, and you can almost guarantee that there was a scoring error made there. When it comes to helping out on your squad, I prefer to hand the timer off when there's at least one person before me. So when I'm the on-deck shooter, I prefer to hand the timer off. That way I have one shooter's worth of time to get my equipment ready, make sure that my mags are loaded, Make sure my camera is set up if I actually remember to bring it that day, and then get ready to shoot. Same with running the timer. If you're running the timer, feel free to hand it off. Just look at somebody and say, hey, can you take this? Don't get stuck with it. Don't feel obligated to keep it for longer than what you should. Pull your weight, but don't let people place all the responsibility on you because it's usually not your job. If it is your job, obviously this doesn't apply to you. As far as numbers of shooters on a squad, number of guns on a squad, I don't know what the ideal number is. I've seen two different philosophies and I've seen the pros and cons of both. So when you have less shooters on a squad, you're gonna have the shooter on deck, you're gonna have the RO, you're gonna have the scorekeeper, and then you've got one person who just shot, so that's four people right there. If you only have five or six people on your squad, then you're kind of maxed out in terms of having a scorekeeper, the shooter on deck getting ready, the shooter that's actually shooting, and then maybe one or two people to paint. In my experience, that's a little bit too few. So I feel like having six individuals on a squad is about as low as you wanna go. When you start talking five individuals or even less on a squad, it starts to get a little bit chaotic because people are trying to get ready, people are trying to paint, people are trying to RO and keep score, and then you got somebody shooting. It just kind of gets crazy when you have less than five or six people on a squad. So, that being said, I've also seen it the opposite way where you have 14 guns on a squad. Maybe not everybody is shooting two, so you have eight, nine individuals on a squad, and sometimes that can get just as insane and be just as chaotic. Things may start to slow down. In my experience, you'll have two types of squads. Ones that you really flow well with and everything goes great. There's nobody taking the burden of being RO all day. There's nobody taking the burden of keeping score all day. It just flows well. People are painting. People are hurrying up to help. You don't have to ask anybody to get on the ball. Those are the best squads. Those make for the best days, and those are the most fun matches, obviously. And then there's squads that you just don't jive well with. Every five minutes, we're asking who is the shooter. Nobody wants to go down and paint, so you've got people ROing and then going down to paint too and then coming back. And then shooting next. Nobody's stepping up on your squad to call out the shooters and to organize everybody and to just lead the squad. Feel free to do that because somebody needs to do it. Pull your own weight. Don't be a deadbeat. Don't just ride everybody else on the squad and let them do all the work. Help out. Do what you can. Let's talk about a weird equipment issue that I had. This was with my rimfire pistol, uh, Mark III Ruger 2245 light, but I believe it'll still happen with any rimfire pistol like this. So the issue is the way the bullets stack on top of each other in the magazine, the rim sits about a third of the way down the case of the cartridge below it. And the spring pressures from your magazines and them riding up and the pressures of them riding up and stopping all of a sudden causes the rim to dent the case. Now I saw this when I was unloading my mags before, but I didn't really think anything of it because they just came out of the gun, they were unfired, like thought it was okay. And 
eventually I was having so many malfunctions with my gun that it was driving me insane and I was almost ready to give up on rimfire pistols as a whole because I was having so many malfunctions and I couldn't figure it out. I had replaced some springs, I had replaced the extractor, replaced the firing pin, and I was still having these malfunctions and I couldn't figure out why. So I replaced all the springs in my magazines and then I started realizing when I was pulling these bullets out that all the cases were dented. And then I started realizing that I was using ammo that I had pulled out of the magazines from the match before or that I had laying around that I unloaded from magazines before that I just threw into a bag. And it was always that ammo that was causing the malfunctions. Every time I would pull one out of those cases that wouldn't load all the way out, it would have a dent in the case. And then it clicked. I realized, oh, these bullets are getting dented from the rim of the cartridge above it. And then that's causing the bolt, when it comes over it, to not grab it the way that it should be and not apply the pressure to put it in the chamber. So that was one of the most frustrating experiences that I've ever had with a gun. And it was because I was using ammo that I took out of the gun from the match prior. I drove myself crazy replacing parts, troubleshooting everything, and I couldn't figure it out until I saw that. So what I do now, I notice that my Ruger 1022 rimfire rifle, that will eat any of those cases. It doesn't malfunction the same way that the pistol does. I don't know if it's the way the bolt passes over the magazine and picks up the next round or what, but the rimfire rifle seems to like those cases just fine. So now when I get home from a match and I'm unloading my rimfire magazines, I take that ammo and I put it in a pile that I'm only going to shoot out of my rifle. And that has saved me so many headaches and so many malfunctions on the range. I just wanted to share that with everybody. Thanks Derek for the suggestion. Take care of your rimfire guns people. Nothing is more frustrating than a malfunctioning 22 on the range. Alright, no surprise today. We're going back to the book, The Little Book of Talent by Daniel Coyle. 52 tips for improving your skills. And we're just going straight down the list because all these are great so far. Tip number three is steal without apology. I'm going to read a little bit of the section where he talks about some specifics about what he means. He says, when you steal, focus on specifics, not general impressions. Capture concrete facts. The angle of a golfer's left elbow at the top of the backswing. The curve of a surgeon's wrist. The precise shape and the tension of a singer's lips as he hits the high note. The exact length of time a comedian pauses before delivering the punchline. Ask yourself, what exactly are the critical moves here? How do they perform those moves differently than I do? I don't think I really need to explain too much how that applies to shooting, right? All the top guys have material out there and videos out there of them shooting. They're doing what you want to do. Their technique is sitting right in front of you. Try it out yourself. How do they hold their hand? Why do they hold their hands differently than another top shooter? Have you tried both ways? Have you tried in between those? So, it's pretty similar to tip number one, stare at who you want to become, but it's a little bit different. You're not just staring at them now. You're trying to mimic their techniques, discover why they do what they do. So that'll do it for today for the excerpts from the book. Hey guys, coming to you a few days later just to close out this episode, put some closing notes in. It is uh, currently 4 February 2023. Just got done shooting the Thermont Saturday match. That's all eight stages out in Thermont, Maryland. So big thanks to Brandon for running the match while John's out. Big thanks to John for putting in all the work year round. And big thanks to all the setup and teardown guys that are there every single month, even on Wednesdays. Great club, great match. I love it. We always have a great squad out there. Always know everybody. It's a really great environment. So big thank you to everybody that was there today. Huge thanks to Ron for bailing me out. Today was a weird match. Uh, it was super cold, 14 degrees this morning. Probably warmed up to low 30s while we were shooting, but not very much. Wind was whipping. And my rimfire guns, I was shooting RFPO and RFPI today. They were not pleased whatsoever. I just picked up the Volkortz and Scorpion. And I've had a 2245 Light Mark III that I've been running forever since I started shooting Steel Challenge. I just threw a uh, Volkortz and lower on that. But the magazines that I have, I don't know if the springs are needing to do. I don't know if they're just not tuned right right now or if it was just a combination of everything combined with the cold that was making them run really terrible. But I had malfunctions on every single stage almost. Did have some good come out of it today. This was my first match with RFPI. Picked up my master card just at 86, 87%. That's with having a B class stage in there from malfunctions. It was just terrible. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Without that B class stage, 
I ended up 92% overall, so I'm excited to see that RFPI to GM hopefully soon. That'll be fun. Pick up another GM card with that. It actually wasn't that bad. Irons are not my strong suit. So what I do right now when I shoot irons, just because I shoot it so infrequently, I'm really not used to it. I will put a piece of tape right on the edge of my weak eye so it doesn't pick up the sights as easily. I don't want to obscure my whole vision because I still want to be able to focus on the targets out of my weak eye. I just don't want it to be right in line right by where my sights are. So I do obscure like right by my nose where my eye is. I don't want my eye to pick up my sights too much just because I'm pretty inexperienced with iron sights. I ran ISR for a long time just because it shares the platform with the OSR, but iron sights are not my favorite and they're really not my thing, so I need a little assistance there. Once I add the tape, it's pretty good. I'm able to remain mostly target focused and still shoot quick. I know my buddy Winston was asking me about the difference between target versus dot versus sight focus when it comes to irons and optics. And I like to always try to stay target focused. Obviously that's easier said than done. So one exercise I really like to do, obviously it only applies to dots unless you get really weird with it. I'll do this in dry fire. I've never done it in live fire yet. Uh, I don't think it would be super detrimental in live fire, but I've only done it in dry fire so far. So I'll occlude the dot, do some dry fire practice. Generally, I can tell which targets I'm struggling to stay st target focused on, and usually it's the longer, smaller shots. So it, for example, the other day I was uh, dry firing speed option and the option plate. I had a really tough time staying target focused. So with the occluded dot, it stands out a lot because you can't really see anything when you start to be dot focused, and then having the dot occluded kind of forces you to come back into a target focus like that. But honestly, I can't really comment too much on iron sights. I try to stay target focused as much as possible but yeah more to follow we'll see if i end up running irons more this season i may end up running production some and then rfpi that may be a good time the navy just rolled out the fact that we can earn some medals using action shooting matches now the way that will work with centerfire pistols is if you beat faster divisions you can use that in calculating the number of people in your division for example if you're shooting production and you beat 10 people in production and 20 people in carry optics, then there would be 30 people and you would be number one out of 30 if you beat them all. So that boosts the numbers a good bit. So I may end up running some production just to make the numbers of shooters within the division work for me to earn those points and to earn those medals. And I think that'll be really fun. Speaking of amazing people out at Thermont, Maryland, my good friend Denny, who I've shot with almost the entire time that I've been shooting Steel Challenge, Printed me this logo for the podcast on his 3D printer. It looks great. It's going to be over here on set all the time now. And I think it looks great right there, especially over top of the yellow book. So uh, we're going to keep it right there for right now. Thank you so much, Danny. All right, that's all I got for this episode. Thanks, guys.